See, see this picture of churches, it's outposts of God's kingdom designed by God for the good of people and the glory of his name. So let's do this, like right where we live, wherever God leads, let's make disciples and plant and multiply biblical churches. The greatest need in any nation, in any people group is biblical, not American or any other type, but biblical churches. Biblical churches marked by, I would submit, 12 biblical traits. Churches that are practicing biblical evangelism, doing biblical discipleship, submitting to biblical teaching and preaching is the authority in the church, God's word, our authority. Churches devoting themselves to biblical prayer, depending on God, fasting and praying and pleading before God for what can only be accomplished by his hand and will only be attributed to his glory. Like honoring biblical leadership, God's design for pastors, elders, overseers, and deacons, valuing biblical membership, every brother or sister, a meaningful part, member of the body, enjoying biblical fellowship, all the 59 one another commands in scripture, carrying out biblical accountability and discipline according to Jesus' instructions in Matthew 18, gathering for biblical worship to sing and pray and give and study God's word and to spur one another on toward Jesus, celebrating biblical ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper, promoting biblical giving for the building up of the church and the relief of the poor and the spread of the gospel to all the nations, 12th trade, engaging in biblical mission, every local church sending missionaries to unreached people and places. God has designed for every local church don't miss this, your local church, my local church, all of our local churches to send people out for the spread of the gospel to places where the gospel hasn't gone. You put all that together and you realize the church being who God has called the church to be and doing what God has called the church to do is the key. The church is the key to rectifying the great imbalance and to accomplishing the great commission. The key is us together being and doing what God has created us as followers of Christ in churches to be and do. And us multiplying the church, biblical churches around the world, this is the key. My third guarantee, the church has the power to change the world, to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Which leads to this fourth and final guarantee. In the face of opposition, this commission will one day be accomplished and this world will one day be new. So to use the words of Habakkuk 2.14, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So let's unpack this fourth guarantee, just phrase by phrase, as we bring this to a close. In the face of opposition, there are many adversaries. 1 Corinthians 16.89 says, from outside the church, Jesus told us this, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And what Jesus just said in Matthew 24 there happened in Acts, as Peter and John proclaimed the gospel, and they were arrested, and a story that would repeat itself over and over again in the New Testament, all the way to 1 Peter, when we have this letter to suffering, persecuted Christians that says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you test, to test you as though something strange were happening to you. This is not strange, this is expected. It would ultimately cost these disciples their lives. As best as we know, Matthew suffered martyrdom by being slain with a sword at a distant city of Ethiopia. Mark expired at Alexandria after being cruelly dragged through the streets of that city. Luke was hanged upon an olive tree in the classic land of Greece. John was put in a cauldron of boiling oil, but escaped death in a miraculous manner and was afterward banished to Patmos. Peter was crucified at Rome with his head downward, upside down. And James the Greater was beheaded at Jerusalem. James the Less was thrown from a lofty pinnacle of the temple and then beat to death with a fuller's club. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Andrew was bound to a cross whence he preached to his persecutors until he died. Thomas was run through the body with a lance at Coromandel in the East Indies. Judah, Jude was shot to death with arrows. Matthias was first stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas of the Gentiles was stoned to death at Salonica. Paul, after various tortures and persecutions, was at length beheaded by Rome, at Rome by the Emperor Nero. All of them killed, you'll notice, not simply for being Christians, but for proclaiming Christ. So you stay silent as a Christian, you stay on the sidelines of the Great Commission, you don't obey the Great Commission, you'll be okay. You go to the nations proclaiming Jesus as Lord in an effort to lead people to him, you were killed. And it wasn't just these first disciples. This was the story of the early church. This is those who've gone before us. In Justin Martyr's words, no one makes us afraid or leads us into captivity as we have set our faith on Jesus. 
For though we are beheaded and crucified and exposed to beasts and chains and fire and all other forms of torture, torture it is plain that we do not forsake the confession of our faith. But the more things of this kind which happen to us, the more are there others who become believers through the name of Jesus. Tertullian said, we Christians multiply whenever we are mown down by you. The blood of Christians is seed for the church. St. Jerome said, the church of Christ has been founded by shedding its own blood, not that of others, by enduring outrage, not by inflicting it. Persecutions have made it grow, martyrdoms have crowned it. In the words of Spurgeon, never did the church so much prosper and so truly thrive as when she was baptized in the blood. The ship of the church never sails so gloriously as long, along as when the bloody spray of her martyrs falls on her deck. We must suffer and we must die if we are ever to conquer this world for Christ. And this, the Bible tells us, will be true until Jesus comes back. Listen to Revelation chapter 6. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer, watch this, until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. In other words, the final number of martyrs is not yet finished. You just think about what that means. Now, these three billion people won't be reached with the gospel without many Christians losing their lives in love for others. Let me say that one more time. These three billion people will not be reached with the gospel without many more followers of Jesus losing their lives in love for others. Like Jesus has promised, there will be opposition from outside the church and there will be opposition from inside the church. So we talked earlier about how throughout scripture and church history, the global purpose of God has always been resisted by the comfortable people of God. And what I did in your study guide here is I just listed quotes from missionaries who the church tried to talk out of going to the nations. The church tried to stop them from going to the nations. Jim Elliott attended four years at Wheaton College from 1945 to 1949 studying linguistics. He was set on reaching the unreached Aka Indians of Ecuador, but Jim's friends, and family, and church questioned him, asking him if his ministry wouldn't be more effective if he just stayed in the United States. He had such a gift for Bible teaching and preaching, so they pleaded him for him to stay in the homeland. Here's what Eliot said in response. Surely those who know the great passionate heart of Jehovah must deny their own loves to share in the statement of his. Consider the call from the throne above, go ye. From round about, come over and help us. Even the call from the damned souls below, send Lazarus to my brothers, that they may come not to this place. Impelled then by these voices, I dare not stay home while Kecha was perished. It's Aka Indians. So what if the well-fed church in the homeland needs stirring? They have the scriptures, Moses and the prophets, and a whole lot more. Their condemnation is written on their bank books and in the dust on their Bible covers. American believers have sold their lives to the service of mammon, and God has his rightful way of dealing with those who succumb to the spirit of Laodicea. On January 8th, 1956, Jim Elliott and four other missionary men died on the river beach by the spear of those they were trying to reach. And since that day, those Indians have been led to Christ by Jim Elliott's own wife and other family members and multitudes have surrendered to the mission field as a result of Jim Elliott's life and death. And thousands of lives and ministries and churches have been blessed and changed by his words. Praise God, the church could not stop Jim Elliott. I think David Livingston, missionary to Africa, right when he got to Africa, he was mauled by a lion. When he was preparing to leave, he wrote to the London Missionary Society, and he, he said, so powerfully convinced am I that it is the will of our Lord that I should go, I will go no matter who opposes me. So he came back home to much fanfare after his initial voyage there, was invited to travel and speak everywhere. He pleaded with churches and missions organizations, I beg you to direct your attention to Africa. I know that in a few years I shall be cut off in that country which is now open. Do not let it be shut again. I go back to Africa to try to make an open path for commerce and Christianity. It's for you to carry out the work, it's for you to carry out the work which I have begun. I leave it with you. On his next journey back to England, he was treated much differently. This time there was no press, no pastors, no ministers, no government officials waiting to welcome him home. So he went back to Africa to give the rest of his life there. For years, many began to believe that he had died in the middle of the jungle, till a journalist 
Henry Morton Stanley was sent into Africa for two reasons. One, to find if Livingston was still alive, and two, to persuade him to come back home to be with his family and his friends and his church. Stanley eventually found him, pleaded with him for him to come home. He promised that if he returned, he would receive many honors and fortune in addition to being with people who were closest to him and loved and cared for him, but Livingston said no. And a year later, at the age of 60, Livingston was camped in the middle of inland Africa with a host of Africans. One came to him in the morning, found him by his bedside in a posture of prayer with his head in his hands. He had died while praying. And instead of burying his body there, these natives decided to travel a thousand miles from inland Africa to the coast so they could send his body back to England for proper burial. But before beginning their journey, they took Livingston's heart and they buried it in Africa, the country for which he had given his life in the cause of Christ. Praise God, the church could not stop David Livingston. And, and I would say, like, I'm not saying all these people are perfect and all the things they did. We have a lot to learn from what they did, but that's the point. We, we learn from what they did is they went. When William Carey decided to go to India, he addressed a conference of ministers about the need to go to India. And one man stood up and scolded him, saying, sit down, young man. You are an enthusiast. When God pleases to convert the heathen, which is using a word there, basically to describe people without the gospel, he will do it without consulting you or me. Praise God, the church couldn't stop William Carey, who became the father of modern missions. I think about C.T. Studd. He was a wealthy Englishman who sensed God calling him to go to China. His biographer said, Studd met with the strongest op opposition from his own family. That one from their family should become a missionary was the last straw. Every persuasion was used, even to the extent of bringing in Christian workers to dissuade him. One such respected, respected Christian worker said to him, Charlie, I think you are making a great mistake. And Stud responded, let us ask God. I don't want to be pig-headed and go out there of my own accord. I just want to do God's will. That night I couldn't get to sleep, but it seemed as though I heard someone say these words over and over, ask of me and I will give thee the nations for thine inheritance, for the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. I knew it was God's voice speaking to me that I had received my marching orders to go to China. Many said he was making a huge mistake, but he went anyway. And his biographer later writes that the results of his work in China sparked revival among students all across the English-speaking world. How many would fall at this point when God calls along some lonely path, his people are against it? And Stud's story doesn't end there. He returned from China, then went to India. Then when he got back from India, he's 50 years old. Instead of retiring, he decided to go to Sudan. Problem was, he didn't have any money. His doctor told him not to go. The church committee told him not to go. So he wrote a letter to them saying, gentlemen, two, gentlemen, God has called me to go and I will go. I will blaze the trail, though my grave may only become a stepping stone that younger men may follow. And the result of his going was the development of what became known as the Worldwide Evangelization Crusade, ended up planting gospel seeds all across Africa, Asia, South America. And before he died at the age of 70, my favorite quote from C.T. Studd, he said, too long, we've been waiting for one another to begin. The time for waiting is past. Should such men as we fear before the whole world, I before the sleepy, lukewarm, faithless, namby-pamby Christian world, we will dare to trust our God. And we will do it with his joy, unspeakable, singing aloud in our hearts. We will a thousand times sooner die trusting only in God than live trusting in man. And when we come to this position, the battle is already won, and the end of the glorious campaign in sight, we will have the real holiness of God. Not the sickly stuff of talk and dainty words and pretty thoughts. We'll have a real holiness, one of daring faith and works for Jesus Christ. Praise God, the church couldn't stop C.T. Stud. All right, one more, one more. John Patton, I quoted from him earlier. He's a missionary of the New Hebrides. So Patton had served for 10 years as the pastor of a growing urban church in Glasgow, Scotland. But God began to burden his heart for the New Hebrides, Pacific Islands, with cannibalistic peoples, with no knowledge of the gospel. 20 years earlier, two missionaries had gone to the island he wanted to go to, and they'd been cannibalized. So as Patton began to share his desire to go to these people, he wrote, I was besieged with the strongest opposition on all sides. One of my professors told me that I was leaving certainty for uncertainty. I was leaving work in which God had made me greatly useful for work to which I might fail to be useful and only throw my life away among the cannibals. Amongst many who sought to deter me was one dear old Christian gentleman whose crowning argument always was, the cannibals, you'll be eaten by cannibals. John Patton replied to this man, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will arise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. The old gentleman, raising his hands in a deprecating attitude, left the room exclaiming, after that I have nothing more to say. So Patton's church 
grieved, pleaded with him to stay. They offered him a house. They offered him whatever salary he asked for as long as he would stay. So keep in mind, they would not give him the salary if he went to the unreached. Patton wrote, the opposition was so strong from nearly all and many of them warm Christian friends that I was sorely tempted to question whether I was carrying out the divine will or only some headstrong wish of my own. This caused me much anxiety, drove me close to God in prayer. But again, every doubt would vanish when I clearly saw that all at home had free access to the Bible and the means of grace with the gospel light shining all around them while poor heathen again, the unreached is what they're talking about, they were perishing without even the chance of knowing all God's love and mercy to me. So at the age of 33, John Patton traveled to New Hebrides with his wife. Within the first year, his wife and his only child died and he dug their graves with his bare hands. What was the result of their lives and their work? The entire island of Anua came to faith in Christ. The church across Australia, Scotland, all parts of the world was challenged to rise up, make the gospel known among the toughest to reach peoples on the planet. And countless savages across the New Hebrides came to know the peace of Christ. Praise God, the church could not stop John Patton. My brothers and sisters, just don't be surprised when you face opposition to the Great Commission outside the church and inside the church. But this is the fourth guarantee. In the face of opposition, this commission will one day be accomplished. Jesus promised that this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And what that means is that all of Satan's efforts to stop the church will ultimately serve to spread the church. Yes, we see this in the New Testament church history. Just think Acts 7. Saul oversees the stoning of Stephen, first martyr in the church, one of God's choice servants struck down. But then what happens directly as a result of that? Acts 8, the gospel spreads throughout Judea and Samaria, leading to the planting of the church at Antioch in Acts chapter 11, which in Acts chapter 13 just so happens to launch a missionary movement to the nations. And guess who their first two missionaries are? A guy named Barnabas and a guy named Saul. Yes, the same Saul who oversaw Stephen being sown. So follow this. As a terrorist, Paul inadvertently starts a church that one day sends him out as a missionary to the nations. You can't write a script any better than this. Satan's efforts to stop the church will ultimately serve to spread the church. And you take it a step further. Satan's efforts to deceive the nations will ultimately end in the praise of Jesus among the nations. Revelation chapter 12. In other words, here's the guarantee to bank our lives on, our God wins. This commission will one day be accomplished and this world will one day be new. A new heaven and a new earth will come down. God will dwell with us. We will dwell with him. He will wipe every tear from our eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall be mourning or crying or pain. God will make all things new and people from all nations will, guess what? They will enjoy and exalt God in all of his glory forever and ever and ever. Ever. People from all nations will experience God's healing, feast on God's blessing for all of eternity, all the nations, like all of them, all the nations. So let's live today to hasten the coming of that day. That's direct language from 2 Peter 3. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Let's live with hearts that cry, do it, come Lord Jesus. Now some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. If we've read Matthew 24, 14. It says this gospel that came to proclaim throughout the whole world is testimony to all the nations, all the ethnic groups, all the people groups, and then the end will come. We've seen how 7,000 people groups are still not reached with the gospel. So does that mean that Jesus won't or maybe even can't come back today. And I want to be clear, that's not at all what I'm saying because the Bible clearly teaches only God knows when that day will be. And the Bible teaches that could be absolutely today. I'm praying it'll be today before we even finish. How awesome would that be? So we don't, we don't know with 100% accuracy if we have people groups defined perfectly as God would define them. We don't know how God would define when people groups are reached. But this is where I cannot improve on the words of George Ladd. He's a New Testament theologian. He said that Matthew 24, 14 is the single most important verse in the Word of God for the people of God today. And he has written, 
God alone knows the definition of terms. I cannot precisely define who all the nations are, but I do not need to know. I know only one thing. Christ has not yet returned, therefore the task is not yet done. When it is done, Christ will come. Our responsibility is not to insist on defining the terms. Our responsibility is to complete the task. So long as Christ does not return, our work is undone. So let us get busy and complete our mission. Yes, let's live to hasten the coming of that day by spending our lives in obedience to his command today. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. This is him speaking to you and me, to us, of all the nations, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And I am with you always to see this commission through. So with this clear command, this charge, this commission before us, we pray together, God, to help us to rectify the great imbalance. God, help us to change the way we're praying and we're giving and we're going. God, help us to live as disciples of Jesus for whom your global purpose is dictating everything we think and desire and do in our lives and in your church, and God, use us to accomplish the great commission. I pray that the fruit of this night will be tens of thousands of men and women and students living for the day when Revelation 7, 9, and 10 is a reality. And can we just close this way? Can we just read this out loud together all at once in all the places we're gathered like with this vision this hope in our hearts. I th like, thank you for being a part of this night. Like, thank you for setting aside this time, for leaning into this late night, for, for giving as you've given, for praying as you prayed. And I pray that the fruit of our time is, is a tectonic shift in our lives and our families and our churches with this vision on our hearts. So let's just, let's just read together Revelation 7, 9 and 10 out loud, all at the same time in this late hour before God. And then I wanna pray over you. After this I looked, and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice. Let's say it loud. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Oh God, we long and we look forward to the day when what we just read, we will experience. When we will all be together by your grace through Jesus with every nation and tribe and tongue. So we pray, God, please use our lives and the fact is I'm praying right now, can we just all just kind of just put our hands out before God? Just to put our hands out before God. God, use our lives. Here we are, all of us. Use us to rectify this great imbalance and use us to obey your great commission. We say with open hands, our lives are yours. We just want to enjoy and exalt your glory among all the nations. God, I, I pray over every single person listening right now. Psalm 67, your word, oh God, I pray your word over them. Be gracious to them. Bless them, cause your face to shine upon them so that your ways may be known on the earth and your salvation known among the nations through their lives. Father, I pray this over every single person listening right now in Jesus' 
name. Amen.